Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar on mountain clover conservation. Uh, I know I'm really excited for this one. Um, I'm sure we're all going to learn a lot from Angela. Uh, so while you're logging in and getting comfortable in your chair or your couch or wherever you may be, uh, feel free to type into our chat box. I'd love to know where you all are Zooming from. So what place you're in today um, and what your favorite bird is today, because I love hearing what people's favorite birds are in the moment. Sometimes they change. Mine changes every time I get asked. Um, sometimes they're consistent and always the same, but there's so many birds to pick from. So type into the chat who you are, uh, where you're at right now, and your favorite bird of the hour or day or of all life. <laughs> That's why I'm trying now. I'm trying to think of my favorite bird today. I'll go with a short bird. All right. So I did a little example in the chat. So let us know where you're at. Um, when your favorite bird for today, and we'll get started in just a couple minutes. We're waiting on a couple more participants. Uh, so we'll wait for a little bit, and then I'll hand it over to Angela in a second. Ooh, turkey vultures. They'll probably be leaving us soon and migrating. Thank you, Geneva. It's great to see where people are from. I know during this whole, ever since we started this virtual program and doing webinars, we've been having people from all over the United States, some people outside of, outside of the country, which has been really cool. And it's just really allowed us to broaden our horizon. I have Fort Collins and a prairie falcon. I suppose I'd have to say mountain plover, right, Tyler? You could, I, I'm not expecting I could branch that. out. You could branch out if you like. <laughs> It does change. Yeah, it's hard to on, pick one. Yeah. All right, so it looks like most of everyone is here. I'll admit people as they come in, but I don't want to take up any more of Angela's time that I don't have to. Uh, so again, welcome to our webinar on mountain plover conservation. My name is Tyler Cash, uh, and I am the camp and community coordinator for the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. Uh, and joining us today, we have Angela Dwyer, who's one of our habitat coordinators with our stewardship team. And she's based up in Fort Collins. Uh, she's gonna be teaching us today all about mountain plover conservation and the work that the stewardship team and the science team, uh, and now the education team, since we're educating about it, uh, what we've done to help mountain plovers uh, thrive and, and uh, conserve them. So I'm gonna hand it over to Angela. If you just joined us, uh, feel free to type in the chat where you're Zooming from uh, and your favorite bird today. And take it away, Angela. All right, thank you, Tyler. Um, good morning or afternoon, wherever you're from. Uh, thank you so much for your time. I'm really excited to talk about um, a bird that I've enjoyed working with over the years. Um, so as Tyler mentioned, I'm based in our Fort Collins office um, and I've been with Bird Conservancy for nine years now. I started working with mountain plovers early in my career here. It was pretty much exclusively what I was working on. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about this rare and declining species, including touching on an innovative technique that we employed um, for more than a decade where we located and marked nests on farmland. And then I'll touch on some other fun stuff. So I will, you, I don't know if there's a debate between plover and plover. Um, I, I will say plover. The first plovers I ever worked with were on the East Coast, piping plover, Wilson's plover. And it's plover on the East Coast, plover on the West Coast. So I've, I've learned that, but it's hard for me to make that transition even even nearly a decade later. Um, but I've, I've gotten into that debate with some folks. All right, so uh, a little bit about Bird Conservancy. We are a nonprofit, a, a conservation organization, and we focus our work on uh, conserving birds and their habitats. We do this through an integrated approach of science, education, and land stewardship. And I'm gonna focus on the stewardship aspect of things. Um, I'm a part of our stewardship team where we employ um, a, a slew, about 14 private lands wildlife biologists. And, and they are a network of folks who work at local communities. They're actually based remotely. They're not in Bird Conservancy offices. They are Bird Conservancy employees, but we have a partnership with the USDA 
um, and they are based in local USDA offices throughout the Great Plains and West um, in six states. And so they have the ability um, and focus to work with farmers and ranchers directly um, on the ground with habitat projects that both help their operations thrive um, and thus um, provide wildlife habitat. And so our goal, I would say, not just as a stewardship team, but as a whole with Bird Conservancy is to work toward um, functional and sustainable working land such that farming and ranching operations for grassland birds um, and other wildlife that depend on these systems are thriving. Nearly 70% uh, of the West is in some kind of private ownership. So many of our birds either breed, migrate, or spend winter on, on private lands. So today I'm gonna to first take a step back and just talk about the state of our birds. And then I'm gonna focus in on um, bird conservation in agricultural landscapes, highlighting mountain plover as the case study for that. So first, um, I do wanna talk about where we are with birds in general. Um, you may know about this, I'm sure, but in 2019, a study was published in Science showing that we've lost nearly 3 billion birds since 1970. And you can visit this website to learn more, 3billionbirds.org. There are some really great resources, um, how people in their everyday lives can make changes to help birds. So if we drill down by bird guild, you can see at the bottom in the red box <clears throat> that grassland birds are in the steepest decline of all bird guilds since 1970. And if you think about the millions of years of evolution for these species to exist and thrive, and in just 50 years, half were gone, that is quite daunting and devastating. Um, and we actually use and think about birds as indicators of ecosystem health. So it isn't just a matter of birds are lost, but what is that saying about the environment? What is going on that is indicating there's something greater happening potentially to our landscapes um, or our waters? And a lot of that could have drastic effects for humans as well. Um, and then if you'll notice that, so every guild is declining except for the wetland birds at the very top. And I would attribute that to the um, huge efforts for conserving and water and, and managing for waterfowl habitat. Um, and, and so the, that group of birds is a great example of how putting a lot of resources into habitat improvements and habitat creation through wetlands, um, actually there, there can be um, a reverse in that. And so I do, I like this graphic. I like to show people, I think it's very hard to visualize and conceptualize grassland birds and, and where they occur. Um, so this helps a little bit hone in on both breeding and wintering ground of, of many of our grassland bird species. Mostly all of them inhabit some portion of northern or central the United States, but the heaviest concentration, so this black boundary is what we define as the Great Plains ecosystem. And so the heaviest concentration in this orange, um, maybe, a, maybe a reddish color, uh, located in the northern part of the Great Plains, southern part of Canada. Uh, and so that's a huge area of conservation concern. There's a lot of grassland there that is intact. Um, a lot of ranchers that are working hard to keep their operations going for not just their own livelihoods, but keeping that connectivity of grass together um, benefits the ecosystem as a whole and thus the grassland birds that breed there. And then, so that's the graphic on the left. The graphic on the right shows um, the left is breeding season and the right is during winter. So you'll see the shift and a lot of our grassland birds are going to Southern Texas and Mexico during winter. And we actually have a, a long-term winter effort in winter in Mexico, um, focused on trying to understand declines in during winter. So a lot of grassland birds are thought to have very low survival during winter and that's why they're maybe not returning um, during the breeding season. And so we've spent, more than a decade, maybe two decades, examining those effects. So some of the 
factors affecting loss of birds. We typically think of habitat loss and that that is a primary one. Um, but alongside that are, is just general changes to the prairie ecosystem, um, human use just increasing in terms of pesticides, um, growing urbanization, woody plant encroachment. So trees are great where trees should occur, but in the prairie um, is not a great place for, for trees. Um, largely cedar encroachment is has become a huge ecological um, detriment for farmers and ranchers, for water use, um, and for many of na our native grassland birds that no longer encompass those places that are um, encroached by trees. And then also many of our species evolved with grazers, grazers such as um, wild grazers would be antelope, elk, deer, and then livestock, cattle, sheep. Um, and, and so they do depend on the disturbances actually created by grazing and grazing can really benefit um, prairie species, grass species. And, and they also benefited from a lot of fire rolling through the plains. And so currently we mimic those pre-colonial conditions by um, implementing grazing plans with ranchers to mimic those situations and prescribed fire as well. And so this model helps, I think, will set us up nicely as we, we dive into um, mountain plover habitat, but it really, it, it's simplistic a little bit, but it, it does provide a good generalization of the varying degrees of vegetation types um, and how that can create diversity in bird species. So you could see this gradient, the more vegetation maybe leading to trees over to the right side at the bottom here, um, to a shrub tree state, you, you're gonna get maybe some of these um, outliers on the far right and then on the far, and it's also a response to grazing. Uh, so grazing can have an impact on what species will occur as well. And so you'll see mountain plover is on the extreme end of short grass, bare ground, and um, <clears throat> a preference for heavier grazing for, for that habitat. Also climate is very important to, as an indicator for what could occur. Um, and so we often think about climate as we're working with producers on grazing plans as well. And that does include drought and flood. All right, so now let's switch and get to the heart of it. Um, we'll focus on mountain plover, a little background about this bird. Uh, it is considered a shorebird, although really not found at the beach very much. They will forage around shorelines occasionally, uh, <clears throat> especially dry playas in the Great Plains. So those are really just shallow ephemeral wetlands, ephemeral being um, they dry up and they have wet, wet and dry periods. Uh, very much a short grass prairie specialist. And in the same category family as uh, other plovers, piping, snowy, Wilsons, et cetera. Um, they do have a kind of fun stop and go running motion. So they don't flush very easily unless they're really um, disturbed quite quickly. So they'll just kind of run away. And uh, with that, if you know what you're looking at, they can be easy to find and to observe for a long period of time. Uh, I do sometimes get calls um, from folks that say that they've seen mountain plovers, but uh, really it ends up just being a kill deer. So that's a very common mistake. Uh, they look very similar, especially off in a distance, but as you'll see the kill deer, and you probably have seen this many times, but they do have those darker bands uh, and they're just found everywhere. So the, um, I did mention it's a short grass prairie specialist and you'll see it is endemic, meaning only found here in this part of its range. So orange being where it spends time during the summer. So summer and then each of the fall and spring migrations um, only in these states and then wintering down into Mexico. So not even a far distance migrant, um, very restricted range and restricted habitat type as well. It's a fairly rare species, maybe thought to be about 18,000 individuals. Um, that is an older population estimate. They're 
very difficult to survey routinely because they are very cryptic, they are hard to find. So it, it is intensive to do a full population survey. They're high on that list of among species of that 30 billion birds that are lost. And then breeding bird survey um, results indicate uh, minus, so a decline of about 3% loss per year since the mid 60s. Um, so if anyone's not familiar with the breeding bird survey, it is a voluntary citizen science um, opportunity anyone can get involved in. Um, and it there are routes all over the US. We also think too from those older population surveys that most of the breeding population actually occurs in Colorado. And so there's been a lot of efforts to really understand that further and also um, work to identify the habitat that they're using and potentially conserve it. Um, if most of the birds are breeding here, um, then there might be more efforts that we can do during the breeding season. <clears throat> we think of them as being quite nomadic, meaning they will um, they will breed in an area, but if they return the following year and they don't like what they see, they'll keep moving until they, they find what they see. They're very particular. Um, and we'll go into habitat in just a little bit. But on the flip side, they can be extremely site faithful. So this photo on the right was a chick that was banded, not in the photo, but was banded as a chick, uh, maybe at about two weeks old. It was the only chick um, that was banded during the time, I believe that was 2014. And, um, and then was located again as an adult. And we could tell that because of the color band combination that's unique to this individual. So we can really understand survival and habitat use by, by color banding. And so here is um, that same bird. Here he is as a chick. Uh, so the nest um, was GPS and located um, here where it says nest where chick hatched in 2014, kind of in the middle of this square. This square is one square, or one square mile. And so when the chick, um, so this is where the nest where the chick came from. Then the following two years later, this is where it was seen. So a, um, a birder had submitted that photo to us and it returned nearly maybe within half a mile or maybe more of its uh, natal area. We did not locate a nest or know if it had a nest, but it was a pretty cool finding for us. Here's another example of just that site fidelity. So in 2013, we found a nest, banded the adult, and then in 2014, the same adult uh, came back and had another nest, um, maybe within 500 meters from where it had the nest in 2013. So this XIOR is the band combination. That's how we would read it. X is the metal band, I is indigo, I believe O for orange, R for red. So that's how we we record that and then would know um, exactly how to read that band and who that bird is. And you could see their band, they're nesting um, in this cropland. Uh, this is really where they like to nest. It's bare ground, it's open. Um, and we'll go into that here next. So historically, prairie dog towns have been their prime um, habitat of choice during the breeding season. Um, the disturbance created by prairie dogs, really just the, the um, mowing down of a lot of that vegetation and the, some of that bare aspect is, is important for them. Um, sometimes they will breed in pastures that are heavily grazed, but they have adapted to these fallow or bare croplands like this photo on the right. This is, this is ideal <laughs> mountain plover habitat. There's not a lot of birds that would would gravitate to this. And it's hard to um, look at this and think of it as bird habitat. Um, but climate also is a major factor too. Uh, I've mentioned that in really wet years that they, they just don't do very well. Vegetation tends to grow really tall. Um, and if it's too tall, they will even abandon nests um, that they've started because they do, they are ground nesters and they really need to be aware of their surroundings. They need to be very vigilant um, of predators. So they have a unique um, mating strategy. It's a uniparental strategy where 
the female will lay um, one to three eggs in one scrape on, a ground, on the ground that a male has created for her. And then she'll do the same in a different scrape. Um, I believe they do this only a couple times. I don't know if they'll make more nests. Um, we don't actually think they're monogamous. So she might have eggs from multiple different fathers. And so this really increases their chances of success by doing this. However, it forces the adults to have to incubate and then rear their chicks all on their own. So they've got to figure out um, how to feed themselves. So they do have to leave their nest. Um, so you can see these eggs are quite camouflaged and that's important as the adult will be gone for a period of time feeding on its own um, and then incubating largely at night where predation is probably higher. Chicks are pre precocial, which ground nesting birds um, often have precocial chicks. They really need to be up and out of that nest um, within hours, maybe a day before um, some creature comes up and wants to eat them. So precocial just means they're, they're hatched fully feathered. Um, they can see, they can feed themselves pretty quickly and they can walk, I would say all within half a day or so. Um, we've seen nests that are vacated within a day once all three eggs hatch. So this is a little video that, uh, let's see, I've got it over here. So I'm gonna play, it's a defensive display just showing their broken wing movement. So the broken wing display is meant to attract a predator to them and to trick a predator away from where, um, maybe their brood is hiding. So I just turn off the volume, the volume doesn't do much. It's a little jerky just with the internet, but this little guy and then he's kind of gone, gone flat to, um, the broken wing is again, meant to, um, try to show a predator that he is the one, he or she is the one that is um, a, a better catch for food because it's weak, but it's all a trick. Um, and so thinking about now the private lands conservation aspect, since they do breed largely on these croplands, um, then there's an opportunity to engage with private landowners here. So in 2003 and in 2011, they were proposed um, by US Fish and Wildlife Service um, to be listed as threatened. And they did not get listed, so they are not listed. However, there was very little known about um, the population size, the population status um, of this species. And that was largely why the proposal was suggested, was just lack of information. And so that triggered a huge effort to get more information. So we started in 2000. Um, three, and it was only a five-year effort, a lot of partners were involved. Um, so this really wasn't just us, um, but we worked in just Colorado to start and covered most of the counties on the Eastern Plains. Um, anywhere there was farm ground, farm ground, we reached out to farmers, um, hired seasonal technicians, uh, and requested permission to access their fields. So we surveyed farm ground where we had permission, mark, found nests, marked them, and monitored um, up until hatching. We then replicated this effort in Nebraska where there's also a small population and a lot of farm ground. Um, and there we, we kept that program going for um, a very long time, more than a decade. The photo on the top right is a farmer we worked with, Larry, who's also on the bottom. So Larry, based in Nebraska, helped recruit all the farmers we worked with. Um, and he's still sending, just last night, he sent me um, a note of a banded plover that he saw in a flock of 40. So he's still looking out for these guys. <clears throat> so let's talk about nest marking, what that means. Uh, so we, when we were doing this effort, we hired seasonal technicians throughout the breeding season. Um, and we just drove transects on farm ground looking for nests. And so you flood, you can flush the bird up um, pretty easily. And then they actually will guide you back to the nest. So once you know you flushed a bird, um, you stop, you step back, you drive back and you kind of wait for that bird to come back to the nest. Uh, it actually works quite well. 
Once you find the nest, we mark it with a GPS uh, here in the center where it says nest. And then what's crucial are there are four tall, brightly colored orange stakes in each of the four cardinal directions. And so those are for the farmer's benefit so that they can continue their operations. They don't have to get off the tractor. They don't have to lose time. Um, and they just need to go around the nest that we've marked. And so you could see here's um, a little guy in the middle in the red circle, happily incubating um, with the patch of veg that is remaining when the farmer went around it. We also had many farmers actually find nests themselves from their tractor um, and, and they were quite good at it. Over the years, we've conducted a number of research projects to evaluate the efficacy of nest marking because it's very time consumptive um, and also just learning a little bit more about their survival and habitat use um, in this area. So I'm not gonna go through all of these, but we've been um, trying to really understand the suite of um, questions that we, we could anticipate, um, even all the way down to a landowner survey where we really wanted to understand what's motivating farmers to participate in this program. This is kind of a cool one I just wanted to show. It's from a graduate student, Colin Woolley at the time. He now works for, for Bird Conservancy, um, but this was his work was started in 2013. And so he was interested in this is in southeast Nebraska, southwest Nebraska, and he was interested in how they're, these guys are using cropland and if they're using other habitat in the area. So in this part of their range, um, I would say only about 30% of, of the landscape was cropland, but that was the primary habitat they were selecting. And so this, is, this map is a home range. And so what we're looking at in red is the star is the nest location. The adult was um, captured and had put a GPS tag on it. Um, the tag was then recovered at some point later when, um, and that's how we received this data, combined with some radio telemetry for when there were broods. But the red boundary here is the home range during incubation. So I mentioned that the adult has is the only parent for that brood, does not share duties with um, its mate. So it'll be off nest feeding. So this is where it's going during the time where it still has a nest, but it needs to go feed itself. So it stays fairly close. And then in blue is when it's got the brood. So you can see that the little brood, they've taken um, kind of route south. And it's interesting too, just because you can see it follows the crop line. So the row crops that are diagonal, um, and then all the way straight down south. It's just kind of a, a fun uh, visual of, of how these, these guys are using the landscape. We've recently um, expanded our interest into migratory connectivity and addressing research and conservation gaps broader than just during the breeding season. Um, for many birds, it's very challenging to know uh, what is occurring during these stopover areas. Either are they surviving or where are they going? Um, some birds are easier to track than others, um, but there was a lot of uh, gaps that we were trying to first identify in recent years. And I had mentioned, um, and the range map showed that they spend some time in Mexico. So we've worked with uh, university partners uh, and graduate students to, um, to try to connect the dots through the breeding and winter. Um, and we had a graduate student do some estimates in, in winter too, a, a Mexican student. Uh, and so we got some really interesting results um, in the last couple of years, of, mostly in terms of identifying and quantifying some of the estimates in Mexico. There was a lot of qualitative or anecdotal data, but there was actually identified to be maybe a resident population down there, which I think um, was kind of suspected, but we know that now through, through banding. This photo of this bird on the right, you'll see he does have bands, he or she, um, on its legs. This bird was actually um, one of our students, Allie, she banded this bird in her site, which is uh, South Park, that's sort of central Colorado. And she went down to Mexico to help Julio, the student there, do winter surveys. And she saw her own bird down in Mexico. Um, so that was, I think, pretty exciting. So that's her photo. 
So this is kind of a fun map um, with a first look at identifying those routes and how we are trying to make those connections through migration. So I'm gonna walk you through what we're looking at. So we've got every color represents an individual. So there's eight birds uh, and right here in central Colorado, the dot on top is black, but that is where seven of the birds um, had nests. So that's where they started. And then up in Wyoming, one bird was captured. So what, what happened was towards the end of incubation, the graduate student who did this effort, Allie, she would capture a bird, put a GPS tag on it, and then it would go off for migration winter. The following year is when she got the tag back. So she actually, these aren't satellite tags. Uh, they don't transmit. You actually have to catch the bird again to get the data. Um, the technology is improving, so we don't have to do this as much anymore. So she caught these birds again the next year, and she actually did this for a few years. Um, so there's some kind of really interesting things here. Uh, one, we don't have any bird going to Mexico, even though we're pretty sure that some of them do. They could be coming from a different population because there's populations in Montana that we don't have tags on. And you could see this huge congregation down in Southern Texas um, and then over in California. One thing that's pretty cool here too, which you can't tell, um, but I will, I will describe it. The red heading to California and the pink is actually the same bird. So Allie caught a bird, I forget what year it was. I think it was 2017. It came back and she put a new tag on it in 2018 and caught it again in 2019 um, to retrieve the tag. She did not deploy it again. She did not wanna put it through a third year of that, uh, but that's pretty phenomenal. And this route that it took up into Northwest Colorado, I don't know what that's about, but quite fascinating. So what I have, in the white square is, is something that we've honed in on. This is during fall migration. And we saw these hits, just all these dots on this map and just, it made us ask what is going on. So zooming in on that area, you can see that these guys spent a lot of time in Southeast Colorado and Southwest um, Kansas, which then led us to um, ground truth and survey the area. We wanted to both confirm the, the tag data, and then also get an estimate of population size and habitat use. So they still are using ag fields, kind of as suspected during migration and during winter. Um, that combined with prairie dog towns as well in the winter. And then we had an estimate um, from Allie's data of nearly 1500 birds just spending several weeks um, during the fall in that area. So that presents an opportunity to um, maybe develop some conservation strategies as the next step. And then finally, I wanted to share some fun stuff. So years ago, we put out some game cameras at nests as an outreach strategy for the farmers who allowed us to find and mark nests. Some of them still hadn't seen a plover. They just gave us permission to go do it. And then that was that. So we really wanted to bring these guys to them if they couldn't see these guys themselves. So you'll see the adult is incubating. There's a little baby baby chick to its right. That's, that's fairly new. Um, just a cute photo. One at night with an adult and a little chick. And then this one is one of my favorites. It's, uh, we do know this about, about these birds and others, uh, ground nesting birds, but you'll see the adult has an egg shell in its beak and it's running away. So it's it's taking that eggshell and gonna go hide it somewhere else, get rid of the evidence, get rid of the scent, um, that sort of thing as a protection measure for its nest. So its nest is um, to the left on the ground, two eggs in the back I can see and a little new chick that's right up front. And so I definitely have to acknowledge the graduate students over the years, and there's not all of them are featured here, but um, that have done so much research and really invaluable work that, that we even have the information that we have because of them. And it's such a great opportunity for anyone thinking of going into this field as a student to be able to connect to nonprofits like us and agencies and, and have some of that experience before um, 
getting out into the real world it just opens the door to so many partnerships. Certainly need to credit um, the amazing photographers uh, where all these photos came from, which is mostly those students and other technicians. And then of course, in general at Bird Conservancy, we don't do this work alone. We can't do this work alone. So conservation has to be collaborative. I'm sure I'm missing some partners, but um, these are some of the main ones um, that really help us move the needle. All right, and that's all I have. I'll leave this up as kind of a, a nice thing to look at. If anyone has any questions, I'm happy to take them, but you can see too, just the care that they take in constructing their nests. I mean, they do decorate it, provide these pebbles, this one in the middle of a cow patty. Um, but anyways, so yeah, I will answer any questions and thanks again for your time. Awesome. Thank you so much, Angela. I feel like I learned so much. It's so great to see like how we are collecting our data and then how we analyze it as well. I think that's, you know, how we interpret all this data is really cool. Um, if anybody has a question, you could either unmute yourself if you like, there's not too many participants. Uh, so you can either unmute yourself and ask directly to Angela, um, or you can type your question into the chat and I would be happy to relay that over. Um, I know I got, I have a couple of questions for you. Um, if so, while people are thinking, oh, it looks like someone unmuted. Jordan, do you have a question? Maybe not. That's okay. All right. So first off, why did you want to study mountain clovers? Like what, what led you down that path? Um, well, when I was living in North Carolina before we moved to Colorado, which has been about a decade or so ago, um, I was working with beach nesting birds on the East Coast. Um, it was sort of just my first real job and it seemed appealing. And so the transfer of knowledge from a piping plover on a sandy beach to a mountain plover on a sandy farm field was, was fairly easy. Um, I, so I had that sort of plover ecology background when this position came up. Uh, it just instantly struck me as something that I would love to do. Um, and working with farmers is so much more exciting than um, beach goers. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's, it's just kind of been great to work on the plains and just out in the prairie. It's such an under, underestimated ecosystem and full of diversity, even at, surrounded by farm fields. Yeah, I feel like seeing that contrast of like the same kind of bird, but in different habitats is pretty cool. Um, um, we have a question. Oh, go ahead. Um, um, do you know where I can find them? That's a great question. <clears throat> yeah, so they're historically used the, the Pawnee National Grasslands, which is located, um, east of, northeast of Fort Collins, east of sort of, I'm trying to think of the, the, the most, the closest city, Nunn, Colorado, if you head east, you're going to hit the grasslands. Um, but if you look up Pawnee National Grasslands, um, there's a lot of maps and locations to where you could go look for them. You could call their office and they could tell you specifically where they have had uh, nesting birds. You could only find them really, I would say easiest is April, March and April when they're first arriving. Um, once they have nests in May and June, they're going to be kind of camouflaged and I think a lot harder to find. You could also drive some of the county roads, um, uh, depending on where you are in, in southwestern um, Nebraska in Kimball County or Weld County uh, and just drive up and down. If you see any kind of open fallow farm ground during April and March, April, May, and then in the fall migration, we'll, we're starting to see them kind of flock up too. Um, and then certainly southeastern Colorado starting about now through October, um, based on that tag data, they're everywhere down there. Um, so they are hard to find, but head towards open farm ground on the Eastern Plains and you could have a chance of seeing one. What do you look up with all the maps and stuff? I forgot. You know what, I can, I can type it in the chat too. 
Yeah, the, the Pawnee National Grasslands, which isn't too far from Denver, a couple hours. Um, a good place to start. Yeah, thanks, Noah. She's one of our bird campers. Thank awesome. you. <laughs> All right, uh, we have another question kind of about where we can find them from the CFO board. Uh, have mountain plovers been found in Larimer County recently, either migrating or breeding? And if so, where? I have to check eBird. I don't know if you've had any reportings recently. Larimer County? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Well, Soapstone, actually. Um, yeah, so um, Soapstone Natural Area used to be another solid, um, reliable place for breeding. They've actually declined. I don't think they're, they've had a lot of birds in recent years, if any. Um, I'd have to, um, one of our other biologists, Aaron Youngberg, Aaron Youngberg has surveyed there for many, many years. So she would know, but I thought, um, there was some of the larger prairie dog towns had plagued out, meaning they got sick and died years ago. And so that loss of habitat just drove the plovers somewhere else. And they, even when the, the prairie dogs, um, returned, and recovered from that disease, the, the plovers didn't return. But that's probably the only known place um, in Larimer County would be Soapstone Prairie. Um, and that's a natural area from the, I think it is, from the city of Fort Collins. Cool. Uh, so we have another question from our buyers. Uh, is there much evidence of mortality due to wheat harvesting activity? Yeah, so that's a great question. We, one of the early research projects was to examine how um, does nest marking really work. Um, so we looked at, this was in the mid 2000s, um, we compared marked plover nests to unmarked fake nests and, and wanted to make that, that full comparison. And so what we found, I think I had it in one of the slides, was um, that nest survival was pretty high for marked nests, like over 70%. Um, and that uh, the loss of the dummy nests, the fake nests was also quite high. Um, if a tractor, the one thing though about these birds is they, a tractor just needs to miss the nest. So they, they're pretty tolerant of disturbance. We've even had nests kind of where the egg the eggs roll out and the nest is gone, but the eggs are fine. And we've kind of created a new nest and put the eggs back. And then the, the adult comes back and incubates it. Um, there's the, the jury is still out. There's a lot of folks that do feel that croplands are just a sink, um, but that's where they're selecting. And there's other factors that we'd have to examine the, the loss of prairie dog towns um, throughout their range. And, and what are some other things we could do to to offset the those losses and their switch to to using crop habitat um, and trying to preserve some of their native habitat as well. Cool. Uh, so you were talking about like capturing these birds, and it's a little different than than capturing songbirds, I presume. Um, so can you kind of describe how you would capture and ban these, whether they're a chick or an adult? Yeah. So the <clears throat> So if you look at these nests, once you find a nest, it's, you've got a good chance of at least seeing the adult. So as I mentioned, the adult hangs out in the area, which makes it a lot more feasible for us to find these nests. Because if the adult just flushed and took off and was gone, then we probably would have no chance. But they really want to get back to incubating that nest. So they're, they're pretty tolerant. Um, so once the adult comes back and we found the nest, then what we do is we put like a metal, a very large metal cage over the nest with a door. Like we create like this trap door and prop it open. And so when the adult comes back to incubate it, it'll just walk through the door and it'll trip a wire. And, um, and we, I have a photo, I think somewhere of an adult just incubating its nest with this cage over it, just like, I don't know what's around me, but I got to incubate my nest. So once the adult is in that, um, we do, 
we can go to the, the cage and just, we can grab the adult that way. Um, and we keep that process pretty short, less than um, anywhere between five and 10 minutes, but um, they, they're they pretty tolerant and it really helps us get data to help us think broadly about the population, which is on such steep decline. So the information is quite valuable. And I will say they are almost impossible to catch during migration or winter. When they're moving or? Yeah, so they, 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 with shorebirds in the winter, you, you can do, there's a lot of techniques to catch flocks of shorebirds in the winter using cannon nets and all kinds of things. But these guys, they might, they do flock up, but I, I wouldn't say it's large numbers. Um, and they're just pretty skittish and savvy. Um, it's been done. I think Allie, the grad student we've been working with for years, was able to catch um, one during winter, I think in Mexico, but it took so much effort <laughs> to so many nets and, or just some, or the net plays in so many places. It was, it is probably not worth the effort actually. So not an easy bird for, for that. Yeah, interesting. Uh, all right, so I have one more question unless nobody else has any, feel free to type them in, but if not, we're gonna let you go. Um, you talked about the low survival rate in winter and how we've been monitoring that for a while. Has there been any, like, do we know why there's a low survival rate in winter yet? Or are we still like just collecting data? Yeah, we, we are, we're not doing survival per se. We don't, um, we've just started. Um, I would say the, the survival studies I was mentioning was more other grass and bird species, but with mountain plover, we are just starting. There's a lot of questions. So um, I hope some of that will come soon. The first thing that Julio, the grad student um, down there was, was just getting an estimate of true population and density, which wasn't really well documented before. And then again, doing some <clears throat> breeding and wintering work um, because they have breeding birds and wintering birds and then identifying if some are staying there year round. And um, so there are some resident birds down there, uh, which it's always quite fascinating to be, to be on their, the wintering grounds. and. Um, you know, and why some breed there and why some stay there and just all these these questions and how that could lead to um, survival questions. But the <clears throat> the Mexican prairie dog is actually a protected species in Mexico. So there, there's some conservation efforts around that population. And there are some very large prairie dog towns that could potentially support a large population of, of mountain plover. So it, it's a little different down there than it is in the States, um, but that's kind of what we're starting to identify and figure out. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Angela. That was a great presentation. I really, really, really appreciate you taking the time uh, to present on this cool topic uh, and for helping us out with our webinars. I do wanna let everyone know that's attending right now, it, is that uh, our Bar Lake banding station programs are opening in a couple of days. Uh, and so all of our registration is, is online. Um, I'll give you a link when I send out the follow-up email, uh, but we have slots on the weekends that are open for people to come to our bird banding station. Uh, and you can ask questions about shorebirds, but we'll probably answer more questions about the migrating songbirds that we're catching. Um, but it's a great program. Uh, it's open to the public and we're doing it as safe as possible. So visit our website, our calendar and register for those programs coming up. Uh, I know I'm really excited. And then next month I will be presenting another webinar all about hummingbirds and swifts. So hummingbirds are starting to migrate. Uh, so I wanna tell you all a little bit about hummingbirds and swifts and the projects that we do on them. Uh, so the registration for that is open today. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us. I hope you learned something really cool about mountain plovers and good luck trying to find them if you haven't seen one yet. Uh, it's pretty challenging. And I hope you all have a wonderful weekend uh, and a good start to, to the fall season and migration. So go out and look at some birds. And thank you all. And thank you again, Angela. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, right. Tyler. Yeah. Bye, everyone.